Okay, before anything, I just need to get this out of the way. What the fuck did I just watch? For some reason, I'm starting to notice a bit of a pattern whenever I find myself reviewing an anime. If it's not something from Studio Ghibli or something that is widely popular, it ends up being something from Japan that's just absolutely bonkers. Yes, I know that some people might say that, well, that's Japan for ya! They're always weird. Oh, no, 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 no. I know what's Japan weird, and the stuff I've seen seriously challenges that. Now, don't get me wrong, there are some of those animes that I ended up highly enjoying, like Holic and Nyaki. There are some that can simultaneously be weird and good. But then there are others that are extremely difficult to look past its surreal nature. <laughs> to put it nicely, it's honestly a uh, surprise whenever I would go and get requested to do a review of an anime. Now, of course, there is a very good chance that it could actually turn out to be awesome, which is the case with many of them, but it's just that I never know what kind of twisted realm I'll suddenly find myself into whenever I would get requested some kind of anime I've never heard of before, and then as it turns out, well, it's something that I certainly would never expect, uh, but I know that it is a little bit weird that I would start the review this way, but the reason why I just need to get this out of my system is because I can't help but think of this as I was working on my next review while watching Cutie Honey. I'll be honest, I've never heard of Cutie Honey before starting this review, but I guess it shows how my anime knowledge is a bit rusty since she's one of the biggest names in Japanese media for around 50 years. Created by influential manga artist Go Nagai, not only was Cutie Honey considered the first female protagonist in a shonen manga, but she was also credited to have pioneered the magical girl genre, or at least one of the first to have popularized it. Both the manga and the first anime made their debut on October of 1973, and while it found a bit of success during that time, it wasn't until the 1990s rolled along where her true fame came in and her legacy has since expanded to numerous of mediums where they all tell the same story of the girl who can transform into several different personas, but all share the same goal of vanquishing evil in the name of good and love. Not to mention that it features one of Japan's most well-known theme songs. <laughs> But let's get back to the point of all this. Among all the versions of Cutie Honey, what exactly am I reviewing here? Well, to be specific, I'm gonna talk about New Cutie Honey, the 1994 OVA series. This one may not have a lot of episodes, but it sure wanted to make the most out of them to deliver as much of what Honey does best. All right, it's time to change. As I said before, I knew literally nothing about Cutie Honey before actually watching this series. So this is just to say that this review is going to be coming from the perspective of a newcomer. Someone who came in absolutely fresh, knowing nothing about the franchise at all, before beginning to go and watch New Cutie Honey. But then again, it shouldn't be that hard with this series in particular, especially the fact that it is so short and it's about eight episodes long. So honestly, even with that small length, it should be a breeze for me, right? Let me tell you what I went through. The best way to describe new cutie honey is that this is a battle of good versus evil. I know that sounds a little vague, and that could summarize almost every story ever, but this is a case where that's the prominent theme of all this. Across the series, it heavily emphasizes how this is the power of good trying to take down evil as much as possible, even emphasizing that Honey is like an angel from heaven and her opponents are like demons from hell. 
In fact, the characters bring up that the bad guys want to literally conquer the world using the forces of evil, and that the only way to stop it is with good and love. I know that sounds cheesy as heck, but don't blame me. Blame the dialogue because the way it's written almost feels satirical. It's the kind that sounds like it's making fun of old Disney movies, but it actually takes itself quite seriously with the kind of lines that are hilariously cliched. Do you understand why this is so? Human souls are the source of our power, and human souls are inherently evil! No! I believe in the human soul! I believe in man's innate humanity! The human heart is the birthplace of kindness and love! Okay, if we're going into specifics here, this is actually a sequel, where it's set a hundred years after the events of the original. However, the show is completely split into two parts. The first part has a full narrative where Honey and her friends have to stop this big Ganondorf guy called Dolmek, who literally considers himself the Lord of Darkness before he tries to take over the world with evil and revive Honey's old nemesis, Panther Zora. The second half, however, is just episodic. Take down the villain of the episode who is connected to Zora and make sure that the day is saved. Already from this, it feels like there's no consistency. I understand that it's a serious challenge to make a major story in only a handful of episodes. I mean, not everyone can be over the garden wall. But even if this plotline was cornier than the state of Iowa, I was curious to see what direction they would take with this, how the characters will evolve with the journey, and how big will Honey's threats will become. And by the time they take down Dolmek after episode 4, they kind of just gave up on that and continue with just filler episodes. Listen, I do not oppose one or the other. If the series wanted to tell one major narrative or have a set of smaller stories, that's fine. But it has to be one or the other. You can't do both like this because then the series as a whole becomes a disappointment and it makes it look like you're only half-assing the plot. Quite literally, since the actual plot is just half of the show. It sucks, but then again, I get the impression that the story is not why people want to see this series. Maybe as long as the characters are good, they can be strong enough to carry the OVA to be worthwhile, right? Well... I wouldn't go as far as to say that, but they are a, uh, unique bunch. Yes, with only 8 episodes, it doesn't leave much room to develop the cast, and it's true that some do come out as one-dimensional. But even if they only have one trait, they sure try to make the most out of it. Honey herself is probably the best thing to come out of the series. Sure, as the angel of good, she's a stereotypical hero but it shows that she's having fun with it along the way. Playing with all her different transformations, lets out an admirable confidence, and acts like a superhero where she's not afraid to make quips off of her enemies. I'm tired of this song already! Sing something different! Even outside the battles, she's a kind-hearted girl next door who puts others above herself. In fact, that's what actually fuels her powers to help destroy whatever evil she faces, and never once does the anime treat her less than a real person with feelings. Along her side, there's Choke, who is usually the dude in distress that has a crush on Honey, his parents Daiko and Akakabu, the ragtag thieving duo, and Danbei Hayami, the only other recurring character who is now a cyborg, and reminds the audience that you can't have an anime without an old perverted master. Oh, that face, that voice, these panties! <laughs> also, do you like some extra cheese with your corn? Well, you're in luck, because another factor into the cheesiness of this series is from the voice acting. By the way, as you could probably tell, I watched the dub version of this. Not my choice, I was literally specified to do so on the request. Anyways, everyone is so over the top with their performance that, even if they try, it's hard to take anyone seriously, especially when they try to emphasize their side. This is definitely the case with the villains, where they are less about their personalities, and more about their ability of how much they embrace their dark side. I'm not sure, but I think it was required during the recording to have at least one moment where the episode's bad guy makes a ridiculous maniacal laugh. Behold the real Jewel Princess! 
But that's just the general stuff about the series. But if I may take a guess, I don't think people would go and watch new Cutie Honey just so that they could be invested in the plot. Oh, no, 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 no. It's obviously for something else. Something that is not only a signature trait or something that is at least unique for this version of new Cutie Honey, but it's also the primary reason as to why this is one of the weirdest experiences I've had when watching an anime so far. Now, I don't normally ask this, especially for an animated project, but it needs to be said, it needs to be asked. Why is this anime so ridiculously horny? Now, before I continue, let's just have the explanation out of the way because there technically is a reason. You see, Gonagai is often noted to be the first to bring eroticism into manga with his first major success, Harenchi Gakuen, and has since become a significant trait of Nagai's works to have them stand out by being a little sexier than your typical Japanese cartoon. But while this may explain why this anime can get horny, it doesn't change how the horniness makes this absolutely crazy! <laughs> Compared to beauty such as yours, these jewels are just bubbles of glass, meaningless trinkets. This is a porn! This is... Right, let's keep going. As you can probably see, when things get erotic in New Cutie Honey, it literally bears it all where Honey needs to get momentarily naked during her transformations, and it's quite rare to find a woman who is able to keep her clothes on by the end of the episode. Now, I am fully aware that even today, fan service is a very common thing in anime. They love teasing weeaboos with voluptuous women showing off the size of their massive bust and place them in some suggestive poses. I get that. But where most other animes offer just a small taste to its audience, New Cutie Honey unleashes everything, showing off plenty of naked women and have some boobs flying around with no regard to whatever situation is happening. Even most of the humor consists of how the characters are horny for Honey and their perverted antics. Sometimes it could be the other way around and Honey can get really flirty with others. Oh, I love your breasts, please! Take me into your embrace, my beloved! It's pornography. <laughs> pornography? It's pornography. It's straight up pornography. It's also worth noting that, despite often taking itself seriously, it does tone that down a bit by the second half where it becomes self-aware and not afraid to break the fourth wall. My contract says I have to wear one of these. If my breasts were damaged, fans everywhere would be grieving. Don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to be some stuck-up celibate here and condemning the show for being sexually graphic. I'll admit, the girls here, especially Honey and Daiko, are really hot. And I do appreciate that the animators worked very hard to animate all those big bouncing bazongas. But the reason why I consider this whole experience so weird and what bothers me about its sexy nature is the fact that it's willing to go to extremes with its nudity, yet never once does it have an actual sex scene. It's like it wants to be a hentai so badly, yet it's too scared to fully commit to it. I mean, if it really wants to go this far by showering the show with uncensored TNA, sexual innuendos, characters that mostly think of sex, and even having one of Honey's forms literally be an SM queen. Ooh. If you can call yourself a princess, princess, just call me the queen! This is. this is a porn! <sighs> then why not just take that one extra step and show some characters having sex? I mean, you're willing to go this far in the not safe for work zone. There's no reason to hold back on having the warrior of love actually making love. You moved, I'm so excited. I've always wanted to suck at the golden. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that you're not- Hey, what are you making us watch? <laughs> but it, it's poor! Anyway, speaking of what's in the visuals, I might as well talk about the visuals themselves. 
And I gotta say that one credit that the animation has is that it's good. Admittedly not great, since it's noticeable that some different studios were working on different episodes, but for what they've done here, it's solid enough as is. The designs are well done, especially to create attractive women to grab the viewer's attention. They also do some nice work to play with the creative looks of the villains and all the different ways that they can be monsters, and it takes great advantage of having a wide color palette, especially to show off all of Honey's forms. However, I can't really say the same about the backgrounds depicting Cosplay City. And yes, that's the actual name of the show's location, don't ask why. I'll admit there's a part of me that does like it because the place looks like it was entirely designed by Gaudi, but then again, I understand the criticisms that it looks ugly because this is supposed to be a typical city and the architecture looks unusually off. But then you have the action scenes. After watching this, I'm convinced of what are the two selling points of the anime. The naked ladies and the action. And I gotta say that the action is also pretty good. With all of Honey's different transformations and the monsters that she faces, the series offers a variety of different action scenes that each hold a fast pace and knows how to keep things intense as her opponents can be a solid match and often end in some close calls. Well then, how about this? Honey Blast! However, much like the horniness, there's another thing with this where it makes the experience feel strange with the way that it unintentionally makes itself different than other animes of its style. I think it's safe to say that this is an adult anime, right? With all the swearing and the tickle biddies at every corner, yet with all of its action, there's very little blood that spilled out. Maybe it's just because I'm used to watching animes where they are never shy with their quantity of blood where one body can cause the flooding scene in The Shining, but in here, even with all the guns, the blades, and whatever weapon or close combat attacks they can think of, very rarely does anyone ever draw out blood. With the amount that has spilled across the entire series, I think there's only enough to fill just one ketchup packet. <laughs> You know, thinking back of all the criticisms that I mentioned about this, it really does all boil down to one major problem. I mean, yeah, this series has a variety of reasons of why this is just absolutely weird, and it can be weird in so many different levels, but when you think about all the issues and all the things of why it makes it weird, they all share one similar issue. Sometimes it wants to go and develop this entire story. Sometimes it wants to be as horny as a hentai. And sometimes it wants to be jam-packed with intense violence. But the truth of them all is that new cutie honey never fully commits to any of them. As a newcomer to the franchise, I'm not hiding that I find new cutie honey to be absolutely weird. However, the weirdness of the series is more in the category of confusing where I have no idea what it's trying to do. And I doubt if the show has any idea either. It has some ideas and it would have been great if it decided to go all in on them, but it never does where it's hard to find it satisfying in any way. Yes, it does have some nice animation, some cool action scenes, and some hot girls to make things sexy. But the story is a mess where it has no order to anything. The sexual undertones makes it feel like you're watching a porn without it actually being a porn. The tone is so melodramatically cliched where it's unintentionally funny at best. And there's just so much about it that makes no sense where it leaves you with more questions than answers. Maybe it's my mistake to come in fresh and it probably would have helped if I knew more about Go Nagai or the Cutie Honey franchise but starting with this is probably not the best idea. In fact, what I'm doing right now with analyzing the OVA is probably not the right thing to do because it's not meant to be taken seriously whatsoever. One thing that's worth noting is that this is not an easy anime to find. Not impossible, 
but it does require a bit of digging and maybe more money than usual to find either a DVD or Blu-ray if you're really that curious to see it for yourself. Honestly, I could see this having its own fan base. There will be those that will enjoy it as a way to turn off your brain and indulge in the cheese-covered hooters. It's like that same feeling when you subscribe to my channel and indulge in all kinds of weird cartoons like this. But at the same time, this is not an anime for everyone. And if you're not sold on the idea of a dumb and horny anime, then this is not worth your time. As for my rating, that's honestly tough to figure out. It's a major mixed bag and there are things that I did like and others that undeniably suck. I think I'll give it a 5 out of 10? I don't know, the whole thing just left me so confused. Has this left me scarred where I will never know what to think whenever I see a girl from New Cutie Honey? Or will none of that matter and I'll still be hypnotized by their big beautiful boobs regardless? <laughs> Speak of the devil. I should have known. I've just about had it with your dirty little minds. All righty, boys. You want to look at naked honeys? That's fine with me. Let me show you what a nice body Daiko has. Feast your eyes on no, me, no, baby. No, please. Let's find out. I don't think this is worth it. I, I think don't. I think I'm good. I you good? Yeah. All right, cool, good.